Thank you all for coming. What, I, what I'd like to do tonight is, rather than go straight into the work, I want to clear up what this means a little to me. This is my term of art. And what I want to do is start with a fantastic pre-modernist painting. This is Angers' painting of the Emperor Napoleon. And it's, even to the Academy, this was considered a little extreme because it's an incredibly coercive painting in a remarkably good way. It's perfectly painted. But the question really needs to be asked is perfectly painted for what? And the for what of this painting is that the relentless clarity of that composition and the perfection of the marks tells the viewer that this is a stand-in for state power. That this painting is, in a sense, in lieu of Napoleon himself. So that when you come to this, you're coming to the perfection of a state. And the way the contract, pre-modernist contract works, is the price you pay for that perfection is that you have to give up your adult relationship with the work of art. You, you are, in a sense, you have to become infected. You have to say, this painting is more clear about what's going on than I am. It has very little ways in which it wants you to participate. You basically just sit back and take it, for better or worse. It's the thing that happens then, and I think, I'm going to start it with Manet. I think you could probably start it differently, but I think Manet is perfect. And the next one is a Manet. This is the Battle of the Kearsarge and the Alabama. These are two ships that were in the American Civil War. And you see to the right there, those were political cartoons contemporaneous with the painting. And you can see from those political cartoons that they couldn't make sense out of this painting. They literally couldn't see it properly. And the reason I think they couldn't see it properly is it's organized in such a way that offers the viewer the agency to complete the image. Because the, the action in this painting is taking place on the top of the painting, pretty much. To our eyes today, I don't think this looks particularly radical, but he had basically pushed this painting up into a Japanese space, put a boat in the front, and some things in the water that have nothing to do with the painting's narrative at all. So most of the painting is devoted to things that don't forward the narrative. So what it did to viewers at that time is they didn't know how the painting was telling them how to look at it. And that was exactly the essence of the modernist contract, is it says you are going to have to choose to get in and co-construct this image with the artist. And you may, in doing that, gain some freedom, but you also put yourself in a vulnerable position where you're no longer in that confident uh, uh, embrace of the state. So now I'm going to go to my own work. But I, I really wanted to establish that clearly in the beginning. Because what I've been doing basically throughout uh, my career as a painter is trying to see how I could create paintings that invited agency on the part of the viewer. I said jokingly to myself this just this last week, actually. They're sort of like IKEA paintings. There's um, you know, some assembly required. So they're, they're, they're made to be helped to be put together by the viewer if the viewer is so inclined. So there are a set of possibilities. And you're going to see as this goes on that the possibilities increase. I picked 2005 only because it's, it's um, what started in 2005 was a set of ideas that get clearer and clearer right up to the last one, which is 2013. But the two things I want you to see in this before I go any further is that the whole missing right-hand side, so to speak, of this painting is, and this will come up over and over, so I want to dwell on this a little, is literally covered over. It's not a depiction of covering. It's an enactment of covering. There was a complete painting there. And 
half of it was covered. The reason I want to make now the distinction between depiction and enactment is a depiction is a fiction that you agree to accept. An enactment is a relatively irrefutable fact. The painting is literally half covered. You don't get invited to decide whether you agree with that or not. It is what actually happened. And this will come up later because there are a lot of depictions. I also greatly liked the lower right hand corner of this for two reasons. I believe on one level, and it's the way abstraction has to try to make meaning, is that composition is content. So that by putting something in the lower corner like that, it's saying that this is a different thing than if it was, say, obviously in the center of the picture. And we would know this by an, in the analogy of, say, watching a play. If you're watching a play and there's a character on stage and they're in the pool of light, or if it's the same character and they're sitting in the shadows in the corner, the composition, if you will, is content. It tells you something about the character's circumstances. So I've tried to use that device in the paintings to further the, um, the narrative. And this was, this was a very important painting for me in 2005. On one level, this little painting functions like a window. But you're going to find that one of the things I do throughout this work is I make propositions that are always choices. There's always enough information that if you're going to see it one way, there's enough information that says you could see it another way. So that they're not, they're not the classic proposition that we want from paintings, which is the artist authoritatively declares something that we then accept or reject. But these vacillate, which is not to everyone's taste, but it is what they do. Because if you look at this little window here, the right-hand edge of it doesn't hold the space properly. It leaks over. And even further, it may even seem uh, to be a mistake, but there's a little shadow in the white field that could create a very different reading of what that black thing is. So a lot of these come out of landscapes, and this one and they were a lot like this. What I decided I wanted to do was take the landscape tropes and move them around and push them up around the painting so that the painting was in some sense almost cartographic, almost that you could fold it out and it would be like, a, like an Indian map of a city in pre-British times. They would show the body of water from the top and then they would lay all the buildings out sideways around the lake. So you've got these two kinds of spaces. So this was an attempt to work with various kinds of Western and Eastern spaces and modern and pre-modern spaces as, as ideas about landscape. One of the things I really like is thinking of um, composition as like the childhood game of Battleship. Because the purpose of the game of Battleship is to put your things where no one will expect them to be. That's the logic of the game. So part of, part of what, I, what I need to do with these paintings is I need to talk about things that seem valuable to me. I need to put things in places where I can tell a, I can tell a, a material narrative, if you will, but I also need to defamiliarize them enough that they're a new idea about it, in much the way I think the last one was a defamiliarization of landscape space. So this is sort of more of an urban space. And it does a couple of things. It pushes the, the subjects, the architectural subjects, out to the margins. And then it moves these elements from left to right, from solid objects to atmosphere. As they track across, they, they dissolve. So they, they're dissolving from side to side and then they're being pushed up into the corners on the left-hand side. I, 
I work pretty much two ways. I try to very often have a little starting point of a drawing. And I think this one probably did have a drawing. Probably had something that was roughly like an architectural house. But I put down this schematic material, the, the curls, the black, the whole black field. And if you look underneath, you can see there was a great deal more of it. And I just kept slowly breaking back into it and pushing on it until this white shape emerged. So it was both planned, the initial set of um, um, simple algorithms, if you will, simple set of, of behaviors that the painting would be put through, and then that would get the painting started, and then the painting takes on a life of its own. So the, the net effect here is, I, for example, I had no idea I was going to have this lawn in the, lower, the whole lower part of the picture, or that it was going to be so clearly like, like a roof and doors and panels. Same thing with this one. Some of this, all of the events on the left, I'm, I'm sorry, on the right, in the black, all of that is almost accidental. This field was put down, it was just, it was kind of a visual scaffolding so that I could have a place to start doing things from. And it, it, it leaked, it just blurred out, and all of it ran out in every which way. And it was only then, after it dried and I put it up, that I began to salvage, in a sense, these more stable forms inside of it. And the thing I think I like most in this painting, let me see if I got that, is this little wooden fence over here. Reminds me of um, the fences in like cartoons from the 20s and 30s in newspapers. There'd be a cat sitting on one of these fences. You know, it's that kind of fence. All right, this, this opinion started out with one thought and, and ended up with another thought. The original thought of this, and again, these are all stand-ins for groups of pictures, and I'll see if I can find it for you. It's pretty tricky. I don't think I can, actually. But there was a symmetrical form in here, and I tried to tease it out recently, and I couldn't find it anymore. But it's, it was in there, and here's what happens with it. Once I put down this symmetrical form, I thought of these black things as like shutters or doors that were literally hinged to the side of the object, like there. And they would alternately, like this one is hinged there and it turns out, and the next one is hinged to this surface and it turns in, and the next one is hinged, and they alternate turning in and out as they hinge around. And this is, this is valuable for me because it helps ground these formal procedures in something approaching representational reality. So it's not, it's not, they're not just design moves, but they have to respond to the limitations of the program, much the way you would have to do if you were going to um, build a house and you said, gee, it'd be really nice if I had a door here. It has to there has to actually be space for the door to turn in. You can't just put the door anywhere. So this has those kind of constraints. So when I was done with this, I had them all pretty much, I'd gone around and I'd folded them. And I did one other thing. If you look at the gray field, the gray field initially was all behind the black object. It was this variegated field. And some of this is the draining out of early moves. But when I was done with this, or when I had it to this point, I thought, uh, I don't know, it's not that interesting. So I thought of another idea. And it's laminated on top of this, and it problematizes the space from top to bottom. And here's what happens. At the top now, all of those shapes, the black shapes, are convex, so that they force the white into being a void. And as you track down, two things happen. The ground rolls up over the form, and the whites gain convexity, and they step forward. So there's a series of transitions in there. And this is the way I always really like to make these paintings, is to have them be series of operations that the, um, that the viewer can choose to engage. And what I do know 
for not having people look at these for years and years, is they rarely do it. Almost never do people engage them. They take them, and this is the most remarkable thing, they take them as flat designs. To take this as a flat design is the least rewarding thing you can do with this. And I thought there was sufficient cues in there about volume and, again, the stones, almost like in the early landscape, that there was sufficient cues in there that told you that this isn't going to be very productive if you leave it as a flat design. I can't make people do these other things with it. But the, um, well, maybe I'll get back to another image later. This was wonderful. I saw this, um, this uh, Veronese in, I guess it was Venice. And the thing I really loved about it is it was these four perfect discs linked to a perfect cube and that nothing inside of there paid any attention to it. It's this incredibly ideal uh, form on the outside and then everything else inside is completely chopped up in as ignoring it. So I actually made my version of that, which is the one to the right, which operates in a very similar way. It's exact same uh, exterior form and then I did the same thing. I just chipped off these bits that come in and out regardless of the uh, the suggestion, if you will, of the container. This one comes out of a Tintoretto, also saw in Venice. And I wish I couldn't find this Tintoretto online, else I'd show you what the original looked like. But it, it really was ex almost exactly like this. And what I wanted to do was, and you can start this either way, but the, the upper left, that black form, has broken through the, the, the fictive edge. The next one is coincident with it going down. This one fits exactly, it's one to one. And then, if you go up, it's starting to squeeze down into the space, and then the fourth one is lightest and is beginning to drift back into a fictive space. The only thing I think, I have this painting in storage, I think I'm gonna get it out and take the dot out of the lower right be better, be really interesting. From too much in the upper left to nothing in the lower right. Look at the good. So I'm going to get back to this. Okay, in this one, and this is something I've done in various ways to pressurize forms, there's, there's quite a bit of information to, to give the viewer the notion that this black form is a figure. But there's also just enough counter information in the margins as this, starting at the smallest, this gets a little bigger, and then it gets a little bigger, and it gets yet bigger. These are beginning, and they're connected by something, if you choose to view it that way, that's almost the edge of a tube here. So maybe this isn't a figure at all. And if anybody has any thoughts as I'm going along, uh, bring them up now. It's fine with me. I put this one in because there's not much to say about this except this is one of my most satisfying paintings to me. I made this painting and I just loved it. I just thought it was just the way I wanted it. It's just orderly enough. It's just pictorial enough. It's just sufficiently object-like enough. The balance in there, I always really like this painting. Do you live with it? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't. I don't. But you know what that gets to, actually, is something that, uh, that I've found over time, is that the really interesting part for me is the resolving the making, and that when they when they're done, it's not that they exactly die, because they hardly do. I really like them still. But they know, but I'm less interested in objects of contemplation and more I'm interested in working out problems of picture space, I guess. So once I got it to a point where I liked it, it did stay up for a long time, but it isn't up now. I wanted to inquire about an earlier 
piece uh, about the right hand edge. On the very top left there, can you speak a little bit to... Um, How far back is it? There, 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 that one. This one? No, next one. That one right there. Okay. The far right, you, 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 the way you've handled the edge. Oh there, yeah, yeah, this. Right there. That and, and what was on the upper left from the most recent one. Yeah. 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 I can. Well, it's funny you mention this one because yeah, I really can. Um, those things on the right, when I did them, they were the result of I had, I don't know what it was. I was, I thought, oh, I'd like to make a painting of a string of hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This doesn't get by me. I, for better or worse, I really do know what's going on in these. So, and I did. I made this painting of these beautiful little hot dogs, this light blue ground, and were kind of like hanging or swinging in the breeze. And I made a few of them, and I thought to myself, oh, God, I hope I don't really like this idea, because <laughs> it's just such a loser. <laughs> and, and actually, after I'd done two really overtly, it really did kind of it lost its sting or its excitement, and I didn't feel like doing a third one. But over time, every once in a while, things will start to get like that. And I'll think, oh, it's those again. So I'll encourage them. So that's what you're looking at there. But you get a good eye, you saw that so quickly. But, but if I can uh, stick with you just for a second. You haven't put them in a straight line. You, you, you've got a slight bend in this vertical column. That's right. Or whatever. Yeah. And that's what's intriguing to me, is that, that little bit of white space there that I saw also in the, in the most recent yeah. The, the struggle is always between making the object and making the image. And the more you make the image, the more, in other words, you have that fictive space, the less well you make the object. The more you make the object, the less well you make the depiction. And what it is, I'll tell you about a book I found um, 40 years ago, I guess. It was a little religious book. And it had these wonderful titles. And one of the titles was Serving Two Masters. And I thought, oh, that's exactly the problem of interesting painting, is you are always serving two masters. You, you're in this completely unsavory situation where the two extremes of the, the thing in itself over here and then the window illusion over here Neither are particularly interesting. So if you conflate them, then you really have a problem. You've got something that's neither fish nor fowl. But I also like it. I like the fact that it isn't stable, that you're always, you're always bringing these things together in a kind of a, it's more like what they call um, uh, an emulsion as opposed to a chemical. When you make salt, you bring two chemicals, you get salt. But an emulsion, like when you bring oil and vinegar together, temporarily, they come together. So I think a really interesting state for me is an emulsion, I guess. You talked about a middle way. Yeah, exactly. The middle one, exactly. OK. So I've made, over the years, a lot of these little iron cross paintings. And for a couple of reasons. One, cruciformal paintings are almost impossible to do anything interesting with. It's a kind of exhausted form. And, but I think, I think I like it precisely because it is so exhausted. It's like painting itself. I, when, when I remember hearing, when I first got to New York, you know, the painting was sort of like done for. I thought, bring it on. I, can, I think I can do something with this. The other, the other thing that makes the cruciform interesting for me is that I was brought up as a Roman Catholic. So I think, I think it's still part of my mental furniture. It's not part of anything I believe anymore, but I think these forms are still in there. So every once in a while, they kind of return. And the reason this one's called Of Painting is it was part of a group of paintings I made where they, here's another one. 
Now this gets, remember I said that there was that fact of covering before, the enactment of covering in the very first slide. This is the fiction, this is the depiction of covering. What I did here is there are three ways to read this. It is either a flat design, which I don't think is a profitable way to read it, although people, I've been surprised they will do that. The two, I think, more interesting ways to read this is that these are a group of paintings in the top, up to here, a group of paintings on a white wall. And the third way to look at this is that those are openings in a white wall and all of that material is continuous and you can follow it down into the painting below. That's what I mean about the choices in the painting. If somebody, if, and I, I should say it also dictated the sizes of these. This is the biggest yellow rectangle that will fit in there as that plays itself out. This one, this is the yellow just missing that and there it is catching the rest of it there. So, and this one is both an autonomous form and a partial form there. So they're all somewhat up for grabs as to where they are and what they are. And the other thing that's going on in here that's sort of the social end of this, the top, of, top part of this painting is in a sense the ideal part. And the bottom part of the painting is the real part. Things are more scattered and disorganized, they're in shadow. The equivalent to that in, in daily life is why people pay to go to restaurants. And I think I've mentioned this in class, I think, once. They pay to go to restaurants because they want the front room experience. They want that top part of that painting. They don't want the prep room and the alley with the dumpsters. That's the bottom part of that painting. So this is the complete experience that people pay good money to avoid, the, to avoid the complete experience when you go to a restaurant. And this one is that same notion as the, as the last one. This is a found painting. This was an abandoned painting from a, an undergrad student here. And my wife, who teaches in the undergrad department, brought it home. And I messed with it and found things. And then basically use the white as a way to carve out signature um, arrangements that we all recognize in painting. So I looked around in the field of action and found, for example, that kind of painting where there's a little event, you know, zen-like sitting in the middle of a field. Here's a little landscape painting. This one I found a two-panel, maybe a marine painting, and this one I picked up the shapes out there and brought them in here and used them to frame that picture. And also, I actually put bolts in it so that you could see that this black bar held the whole thing up like a card. I thought that would encourage people to realize that one of the interesting ways to read this is to read through it. Same set of paintings. So you get that kind of wonderful ideal picture up there, something like an iron cross. But if you follow it down, it becomes a little less organized representational picture. And the other way, again, to look at that is that this is a white card, in a sense, held up in front of a continuous field. But I really, I'm stressing this where I usually don't, only because I've literally had people come to the studio who are in the art world, gallerists, and look at a painting like this, or I think the next one is the one they looked at. No, it isn't. Um, and say to me, after I kind of unpacked it a little for them, they said, oh, it's funny, I thought it was a design. And I thought, boy, this is interesting. Huh. I mean, you can only bring so much to it. You know, you can't. So this, I put this one in because this is a really big painting with it used that little iron cross painting as a painting within a painting. So this is part of a group of things I did called paintings of paintings. And it combines also the um, enactment of covering things and the fiction of covering things. 
So it has enactments and depictions. These are actual enactments, and this literally crosses that. And this is n just a depiction of crossing that. There really is no more yellow underneath it. And the, I think that's important because it, it gets at the idea that when we create a picture, it's, here's, here's what it amounts to, I think. I've always wanted to see if I could bring together the way abstract paintings were made and the way Magritte made surrealist pictures. Because what surrealism does, at least in his hands, it tries to take the ways we see things and put them at the level where they're problematized. The famous, this is not a pipe, problematizes the reading of what you're looking at. This is an attempt to problematize the reading in a similar way so that it brings back into the construction, the picture, as I said earlier, uh, agency on the part of the viewer. And this question of agency, I, I just want to get at a little more. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons I think the modernist contract was constructed is not only to give people uh, agency, give people responsibility, but in later decades, <clears throat> became became apparent that totalitarian forces would abuse people if they didn't have a sense that they could act in making their own decisions about things. And the, maybe the most famous example of that was Bertolt Brecht's notion of alienation, in which he literally steps into ongoing plays and wakes the audience up. Says, "Don't, don't." go to sleep here, don't fall into this. But stay awake, co-construct with me, decide you're gonna accept this, but don't leave me in charge of this. And I think that's really important. Um, there's, um, if you don't, do any of you know Andy Kaufman, the comedian, any of his work? All right, I think Andy Kaufman is the perfect modernist, the stuff is mind-blowingly interesting to me. There's, there's a particular Andy Kaufman video. It's his first visit to David Letterman. It's on YouTube. I watched it again last week. It's so unnerving. It's amazingly unnerving. Because what Andy Kaufman is doing is instead of securely defining for the audience how this is going to go and what they should do with it. He's saying, maybe it's not what you think it is. Do you want to you become responsible for this? You want to laugh at this? You're on your own. So he really pulls back on all of the support systems. It's just, it's unnerving watching him do this. Great stuff. <laughs> So this is uh, The Price of Good News, another one of these ideal and real paintings. The top part being this almost like a, like a playboard or a decoration or something. And then the rest of it, those complete the forms as they tumble down. And the reason I called it The Price of Good News is what I was saying about the restaurants. The Price of Good News, which is the front room of the restaurant, is you pay by not knowing what's really going on. In other words, you don't get the whole cultural chain of custody of what's happening. This is a side project I do. I don't, I just thought I'd show you one of these with these blister packs and I just, I just do things to them. I think they're kind of interesting. It's about like that, it was a, it was a whole gun set. It had a machine gun in it and everything. It's about like that. You can still see the gun in there somewhere. I try to, I try to camouflage the, the, the A reading, so to speak. But if you poke around in there, you can see what's, what was intended. Real guns? <laughs> no, these, these are toys. These are all toy sets. Wouldn't that be great? Real AK-47 in a blister pack. I like that. <laughs> could, could be. Could be. Is it a real painting? 
Oh. Well, in the Andy Kaufman sense, it is if you say so. You know? All right, this is my attempt to uh, resurrect the swastika. Um, I put the, uh, the swastika in the upper part. And, you know, it really drove me nuts that the, um, the Nazis ruined this ancient image for everybody. I mean, everybody had used it. There's countless, there's a whole wonderful little book about how the Nazis ruined the swastika. And it shows all the cultures that have it. So I thought, well, maybe I could, you know, so it wouldn't really be a swastika, it'd be swastika-ish. But it would have that, that wonderful quality of the swastika, which is that it's stable and rotational. The reason it's such an incredibly interesting form is it sits there iconically, but it also has these little legs, so it's constantly almost rotating. It's got pressure on it. So I think that that stability and, and action, arrested action, is what charges the form so much. So I did this, and at that time, I had mirrored the top into the bottom. There was another one like that flipped over. And Suzanne, my wife, came in the, to the studio and said, this is not very interesting. I said, well, what would you recommend? And she said, why don't you take the object in the top and think of it as a real object and try to do something with it? See if you could pretend like you were like digging a hole with it or something. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I kind of manipulated it as I moved it down, and that was what was left of it down there. And it also is vaguely like something I grew up with as a child, because I was on sort of like the tail end of World War II, and they would always show in these newsreels the, the swastika would crash the ground and like turn into lizards or something, it would break apart, you know? So this is like, it's like that ideal and real. And it also is literally real in that there's a continuation of the picture into three space with that cube at the end. It's the only one I think in here that does that. It's a cube of wood. It's just black wood. And when you when you get up close to it, you can still see the grain. It's not, you know, it's not a careful trompe l'oeil. Okay. This this is 2010. We're we're almost we're almost done here. We're getting very close. This painting on the left came out of me reusing devices that I hadn't used since I first got to New York. That painting, the triangular one, I couldn't find any rectangular ones, but they use this banding. And this thing that functions, as I thought, it was almost like a like um, wheat that's been held in the middle. And then this also has those little bandings in it, but it also has this very self-conscious figure ground question. And both of those appeared in this. And this was sort of like a, a wall in a studio that this painting would be on. And then there were these little sticks that were stuck behind it. And there were these little legs and then the shadow beyond. And this is more of that granulated stuff. But this is the one where I began to give this device up for this device of the crossing which, again, is a return to literally the first device I used when I moved to New York. Amazing. Goes around, comes around, literally. Um, and now for the next, from, for the last three years, it has been the dominant um, way to do it. This has perfect example of both uh, depictions and enactments. There is literally a whole object under there that is covered by this red. And these appear to f slide in and out between these red things, but this is at the level of depiction. This isn't really happening. This is only happening as, a, as an idea in picture making. And even here where it begins to work like sky, there's that little margin that you mentioned because there are a lot of little, little tidbits like that. It comes up here and it laps over and, and complicates the reading right there. 
Which is something in the Magritte show he does countless times, uses things like that. We'll have something functional like space and then he'll roll it over and have it perform like an object. This, if you can imagine that the whole image in the middle of this is missing, which is, I guess, hard to imagine, and all you have is a four-color field, that is the way the paintings looked in the early 60s. They were these things I called perfect field paintings. And they were literally four cans of paint, and I would just work my way around and around and around until it was done. So I, I put this in for that reason, but I also like the way in which it comments on studio practice in a way. It's almost like the whole center of this is a painting that's been propped up. More of that folding in and out that we've seen. Is there much texture on that surface? You know, my, uh, there isn't. And I'll tell you why, actually, because there really is a reason for that. They, at one point before this whole group, earlier on in my career, they were very textural. And I remember having a collector in my studio, and he literally pulled up a chair in front of the painting. And he held his hands up near it, and he went, I could just look at this all night. And I, it, it reminded me of Midas, like putting his hands through gold. And it really creeped me out. I thought, Ugh. <laughs> seemed like a very venial take on a painting. So I've been purposely banking the seduction of the paintings and moving the value into the image. So that in fact, when you get up to them, in fact, one of my students here from uh, last year was in my studio and she, she, uh, she looked at the painting up close and she turned to me and she said, boy, you get up close, these, these look like shit. <laughs> I said, I know, I know. So, they're designed to be disappointing. They're designed that way. Is that irony? No, I'll tell you, what it, I'll tell you where it comes from, actually. Um, when I was in high school, I went to Greatest Village, and I went in a poster shop, and they had those racks, you know, with the, all the posters. And I'm kind of nonchalantly flipping through these. And this guy is watching me who works there, and he says to me, uh, what are you doing? I said, look at the picture. He said, go back to the Rembrandt. So I go back to the Rembrandt, and it's, it's his wife with jewelry on. And he said, what do you think of that jewelry? I said, well, it's OK with me. He said, really look at it. Do you understand the meaning of it? He said, the meaning of it is that when you really get up close, it falls apart. It's the illusion of worldly power. I thought, that's interesting. I never looked at paintings that way. So I like the idea that my paintings, as you get up to them, return to that kind of humility. That they're only valuable at the level of the construction with the, in the viewer. And that that's where the value lies. They're not fetish objects. This is the one, I won't go into this too much more, but you can even see a little, little lawn in the corner, little legs holding this thing up. This is the one that the gallerist said he thought was a nice design until I showed him that you didn't have to look at this as a study in uh, received arrangements about reductivist abstraction, like the two motifs at the top, but that it was possible to see them as part of a field that was going behind, and these were punctures. It had never crossed his mind. Another one of those crosses. I put this one in because I think of the, the part in the lower left as sort of a, a legend for the painting at large. So that the whole painting, this is like the microcosm of it. It's arranged almost exactly like the, the larger painting. So it's like what happens in the corner of a map, where it shows you how to read the map. That little painting, in a sense, gives you a rough idea of how to read the big painting.
the spine of the book. I really like this thing. Uh, I want to just go back one and show you this. You see these squares in the corner? If you've been watching them throughout this, I should have pointed it out. There are a lot of these things where they're progressive squares. They'll start little, or things will start little, and they'll grow as they go around, or they'll shrink as they go around, as you will. Um, this is another one of those that has that progressive opening. So it's slightly iconic, but it's also unstable. It may get back to the swastika thing, a way to kind of keep the, keep the thing rotating. But I put these black things in, and I did them with tape. I did them in the studio, and just kept moving them around until, apropos of the battleship analogy, I had them in the most unlikely places I could think to put them. And it, again, you know, I really didn't go into that Manet sufficiently, I don't think. Maybe I did. But you realize the whole, as I said, the middle of the picture is missing. This one is also like that. Things have been, like, pushed out to where the whole center of this picture, which is where it should be the most interesting, is the least interesting. But when I was done with this, I thought, huh, this reminds me of those German crucifixions where there is blood spattered at the bottom of the cross. Because it looks vaguely cruciformal. Not vaguely, it's cruciformal. And I thought, and this is how this title evolved for this one. If, um, if the New Testament is, has any value, it has value because you accept the Christian notion, well, maybe not the only value, but the, one of the values, is that you accept the idea that um, Christ is at the center of it. So I thought, oh, he's the spine of the book, hence the title. When I was first in New York, I was doing paintings like this. I was doing field paintings, all over paintings. But this one has been disrupted by things pushing under it and sticking out from a field within a field. This is a fairly big picture, and is without being able to really say much about why. I think it's just one of, it's one of my favorites. I really like this one. If any of you guys saw The Sandy Show, this was one of those in The Sandy Show. Uh, I think the thing I like about the, the black shapes in the top of this is they're right on the verge of recognition, but they never quite cross over. You know, you can kind of do, um, you know, like a dog's head from the back, maybe, or Aladdin's shoe, or, or a phone. I mean, they'll, they'll almost cross over, whereas these are sort of mute down here. They don't, not much happens with them. But these are real suggestive up here. And I wanted to get that contrast, and I also wanted to get the reading so that these four shapes stuck onto that yellow barrel so strongly that it was really pretty tough to get it to complete the field, although it can. It does follow through. So I like the idea of that, that we're reminded in that sense of uh, gestalt perception that the brain has ways it wants to do things. It wants to get things to stick together. And so I'm always trying to put a little resistance into that. This is the same solution to the, uh, a different solution to the same question as the last one. I love this one. This is, this was like a real gift to me, this painting. Because I worked on this thing for about three weeks, which is fairly long for me. Um, and it had under it, you see the leftover, the pentamento of these elements under here. These are the kind of templates, which is what I called them. These are kind of templates that I used in my paintings in the 1980s. And they were surrogates for the hero in historical paintings. So I'd paint uh, a German romantic landscape and then have this template occupy the space where the hero would normally be. So it sort of discharged the picture. 
So I liked having them under there, but then after a while, it just well, I thought, I don't know what to do here. So I covered it up with these bands and began to work more. And then the last act in this was that black, which folded that thing in as a window, or the possibility of nearly making it a window. It doesn't quite open, if you will, but it's close. And this is the next to the last one. I have one more thing I want to show you, a little quick video. I really am interested in getting at things that have familiar expectations, like the function of yellow and blue in a picture as sky and light, and using it in such a way that it won't quite do that. That becomes, maybe in the, in the Brechtian sense, it becomes a choice on the viewer's part rather than a mandate. So I also, to make this go a little further, I Fictively speaking, I lifted up the right-hand edge of the picture and put those little wedges into that recessional space to keep it up, so to speak. So there's been a lot going on in these having to do with covering, concealing, revealing. Um, and now I'm going to show you a little video I made about, do you guys know what a tracking shot is in movie making? Right? And the purpose of a tracking shot is to give you this really useful information as the camera moves across. It keeps holding on to this information. So I made one, and I euphemistically refer to this as the world's worst tra tracking shot, so I'm going to show you this. Okay, guys. Oh, it's amazing. It was literally almost exactly an hour. Yes. Yeah, I think that is true. And it wasn't my intention. I didn't start out thinking, maybe I, should, maybe I can make a really hermetic picture that 400 people in the world will get behind. You know, I really thought, I'm making a big proposition here. It just, just so, didn't seem to be the case. But so I agree with you. Yeah. There, there is a little with those with those cubes that go around. They'll very often start out as percentages of each other, but I find that they don't necessarily look like the percentages of each other. That they don't feel right. They'll seem to get too big or too little too quickly. So I've gotten in the habit of just eyeballing it, if you will. So there really isn't any, you know. But surprisingly, things like that will show up afterwards. I'll realize, I didn't realize I divided this painting in fifths. I didn't really mean to. But now that I've got this panel in the middle, that's three across, what the remainder, the remainders, oh, curiously, are just the size of the, the panels. So it'll, it'll show up, but not bidden, you know? Well, it's tricky. It's really tricky, because I actually, I can't tell you what I'm going to do tomorrow morning in that studio. I really haven't a clue. That's kind of what I want to do. Oh, good, <laughs> good. So what usually happens is they'll, maybe something will catch my eye in a newspaper. I'll think, oh, that's funny, look at that. And I'll pull it out and it'll go somewhere. Or I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how the last three paintings got made. Remember that one I, I referenced at some point there, I said uh, it was those three panel paintings of red, blue, and black, I guess. Two sets of them, horizontal and vertical. And recently I thought, you know, I wonder if the reason that read so poorly was because the painting is too complicated. And maybe I could reduce it to one panel on one of those little propped up cards and maybe it'll read better. So I recently made three 30 by 40s, which is one of my default sizes. And it really was an attempt to get them to be as readable as possible. 
and, but no one's seen them yet. So maybe they're just as obscure as the rest. I don't know yet. Yeah. Oh, I'll just point. Maybe that's the image you're talking about. It is the one. Yeah. So what I did was I compressed this down, so this sits in one of these these wooden wooden fields, and there are two little legs and a little lawn that runs along the bottom, so to speak. And and I think they read better, but I don't know yet. They read fine for me because I know what I'm, you know, this is my world. I know how to read it. But I realize, like Mark was saying, I think people come in. I saw the Ed Reinhardt show, uh, and it became clear, uh, the one that's up, may still be up at David Nolan, I mean David, David Renner, yeah, that uh, they, you don't have to do this. It's that choosing again. You don't have to do this, but if you want the experience that's embedded intentionally in them, you gotta, you got to give them five minutes. Anything less and nothing happens. They literally don't happen. And I watched everybody, not everyone, but I watched people walk in and go, oh, and then turn around and walk out. I thought, it just can't be done. These things are in time. All paintings are in time. It's just a question of how much time they're in. Another group of paintings that, that comes to mind that's so importantly involved with time that everybody enjoys are Peter Bruegel's paintings. You know, all of the, uh, all of the little anecdotes or the children's games. And everybody will happily spend an hour kind of seeing if they can name all the games. But when it comes to the Reinhardt, they won't give them five minutes because I think they're convinced that there's nothing there to get. So they don't want to be, and it gets back to that, how much responsibility you want to take. They don't want to waste their time. They don't want to be made fools of. So they, you know, they just don't deal with it. Yeah, I, I think, and it gets back to Ed Reinhardt in a funny way. Um, this was the big breakthrough experience for me when I was in high school, is my high school class went to the then New York Coliseum, a building that doesn't exist, and saw Vincent Price's collection of paintings. And, and it was pretty, some of it was pretty good. I mean, it's, he was actually a pretty good collector. And one of them was a big Reinhardt. And I'm with my wise guy high school friends, and I say, how about that for a waste of time, or something like that. And a docent came over and said to me, uh, can I just get you to stand in front of this for a minute? Uh, I said, sure. So I stood in front of it, maybe it was more than a minute, a few minutes, and the forms emerged. And it was the first time in my life that I realized I didn't have perfect information that what I thought I was seeing was just a, a reading, a possible reading, but that there were other ways to know this, and that maybe if I looked at things differently, brought a different set of criteria to it, I could have a different experience. And I think that's ideally what I would like people to have, is that sense that they've got agency, that they can make choices, that there are choices to be made, and that regardless of what the culture is saying politically, or culturally, or in any other way, they can step back from it if they want to and say, does that really make sense? Do I have to look at it that way? And that's, that would be the, what I would ideally like. Well, I think Degas said that you should make a work of art as though you're committing a crime. So that, Fair yeah, that speaks to it. <laughs> And I remember when I was an art student, I used to think, I have to, st I, the only book that, I didn't steal it, my girlfriend stole it for me, it was uh, the, this big, beautiful uh, Corbusier book when I was an undergraduate. And she knew I was nuts for Corbusier. And she took the book out of the Pratt Library, stole it, and gave it to me. I never returned it. I have the book to this day. I thought, I got to have the book. It just transcended received notions of good and evil. It just did. And I, I think, it's funny, we were just, we were just talking about that earlier. There's a, there's a memoir uh, called The Kiss. Uh, it's, and it was pretty scandalous when it came out a few years ago, because this woman talks 
unforgivingly about her relationship, her sexual relationship with her father, who is still alive. And everybody went, well, that's not very nice to do. And she thought, I don't care. I got to do this. This is what the work requires. It's not my problem. I've got to commit the crime. So I think you're supposed to take these things, if you can, and go do, and do it. I, I'll tell you, my only regrets that I ever had were where I could feel the adrenaline rising in me as I was making something transgressive. And I misread the cue and backed away. The only time I've ever thought, oh, that was really a shame. It's too bad I didn't read that as an exciting adrenaline rush and keep going. So I encourage you to, to not worry about the morals of it. Because it's also true that you don't know where this is going. You know, it may play out in a very unexpected way down the road. Pavlov uh, works with these dogs. And what he gets, he feeds the dogs. And every time he feeds the dogs, he rings a bell. And he gets it to a point where whether the food is there or not, the dogs salivate when they hear the bell. So he's conditioned their responses to the stimulus. And I th if I understand what you're saying, uh, that, that's really good, actually. I really like this. Because those panel paintings up there are the conditioned response. They're the, they're the Pavlovian part of the painting. They're the, oh, right, high modernism. I've actually had painters come up to me and go, oh, it's really nice to see you work with that high modernism again. I thought, uh, it's not, it's not, but there, there's a conditioning. You see the, that signifier and you just check it off. It's like clink. You don't think, well, maybe that's not how it's operating this time around. So if I, end, um, who, uh, I really think the work is so boring. I can't even tell you who it is, but who's the guy who did the black paintings at the Wit Wade Guyton. Wade um, the reason I think the Guyton paintings is so incredibly uninteresting is because the real challenge with the painting is to n not take these received high modernist tropes that ring the Pavlovian bells and then put them through a new technology, but it's, it's to actually work with them so that they're reimagined. And you could say, well, that's the whole point of putting them with the printer, it reimagines them. But it doesn't in the way, for example, that uh, Warhol using the silk screen to do the Coke bottles reimagines the silk screen. Because the silk screen is the agent of commerce and the image is the commercial image. So they're, they're coming together to critique each other. There is no intrinsic critique as I see these, between that printer and the high modernist Pavlovian trigger. They're just there together. And everybody likes them there together so much, because they are great together, <laughs> that everybody ignores the fact that there's no point being made. Not to me, anyway. Anyway. Maybe one more and then we're done? Or are we done? I think we're done. Okay, that was super. Thanks a lot. <laughs>